My name is Maureen Hullahan. You're listening to episode number five of the MoMotion podcast. I'm a former college and pro basketball player, now author, publisher, entrepreneur, and director of MoMotion Youth Basketball and Training in New York City. This is part two of my interview with New York Rens coach Andy Borman. Andy played soccer and was a four-year walk-on basketball player at Duke University. Andy has also coached at the grade school, high school, and college level. He's also been the director of House of Sports in Westchester and IMG Academy. In this episode, Andy speaks to players about how important it is to please your coach and to crave feedback. Even if you're on the B team, make sure that you finish what you start, and that means play with your team for the entire season. Andy speaks about how coaches always can rely on players who can handle the basketball. He talks about what it means if the coach is not yelling at you and he feels that playing time must be earned and not given. Andy talks about how important it is for all players to face the basket from as early age as possible and throughout their career. He talks about toughness and he talks about creating your identity. Who are you out there? What do you bring to the table? And I'd like to send a special thank you to Freddy Krueger, aka Red Astaire, for his awesome inspirational music. You can reach me, mo at momotion.org, and Annie Borman at newyorkrens.org. Thank you for your time and support. I hope you enjoy the show. What's happening for a kid to walk up to a coach before practice, after practice, you know, before game, after game, and just say, Coach, I'm not here to complain about anything, but what do you think I should be working on? Like, I want to be the best. I want to have a bigger role, all that. I'm not asking for favors. But you're my coach. What do you think I should be working on? And, and ask for specifics. Listen to them. And they may be right. They may be wrong, whatever. But, like, that's their opinion. And that, that opinion is going to influence your kid's role on that team. And you're going to have coaches at the highest levels that you agree with and disagree with. It's part of life. Right. You're going to have bosses you like and don't like. Like if you, at the end of the day you're training your kid to listen to the people they like, your kid's going to have a rough life. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. What's happening for a kid to walk up to a coach before practice, after practice, you know, before game, after game, and just say, Coach, I'm not here to complain about anything, but what do you think I should be working on? Like, I want to be the best. I want to have a bigger role, all that. I'm not asking for favors, but you're my coach. What do you think I should be working on? And, and ask for specifics. Listen to them. And they may be right, they may be wrong, whatever, but like that's their opinion, and that, that opinion is going to influence your kid's role on that team. And you're going to have coaches at the highest levels that you agree with and disagree with. It's part of life. Right. You're going to have bosses you like and don't like. Like if you, at the end of the day you're training your kid to listen to the people they like, your kid's going to have a rough life. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. To walk up to a coach before practice, after practice, you know, before game, after game, and just say, Coach, I'm not here to complain about anything, but what do you think I should be working on? Like, I want to be the best. I want to have a bigger role, all that. I'm not asking for favors, but you're my coach. What do you think I should be working on? And, and ask for specifics. Listen to them. And they may be right they may be wrong whatever but like that's their opinion and that that opinion is going to influence your kids role on that team and you're going to have coaches at the highest levels that you agree with and disagree with it's part of life right. you're going to have bosses you like and don't like like if you, at the end of the day you're training your kid to listen to the people they like your kid's going to have a rough life i'm sorry that's just the way it is. When should a player start playing basketball? Or, or it's different than soccer. When do you think kids, it's a good age to start? I think that, I think you start whenever they start. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can remember like 
when I started playing. I can remember when I started playing organized sports. Right. Um, what grade were you on your first team? Oh, shoot. I was up fifth, fifth grade on my first team. Yeah, like part of a school team. Yeah. I, think, I think, I don't think I played for any school teams until sixth grade. I played like, CYO, so it was fifth grade. It was, it was third grade for boys, girls in fifth mm-hmm. grade. So what was your first team? Sixth grade, middle school, like we had two teams, green and gold. Gold was like that team. I was on the green, I was on the green team. I was not happy about it. That's um, great. It and, yeah, and the rule was that whatever team you started on, you had to finish on. Like you couldn't like ascend during the season. And I thought that I was better than the eighth grade starting point guard on the gold team. That was my first team. I remember it like like it was yesterday. And the coach was uh, of both teams was a guy named Jimmy Cox, who is one of the all-time – if I could clone a coach to coach sixth through eighth graders across the planet, I would clone Jimmy Cox because um, he was caring and he understood and he was honest – um, so I would, and we practiced together. So I would go into the gym right when school ended. Cause I had about 35 to 40 minutes before every practice. And I would just do full court ball handling drills. So I was just dripping with sweat. And that was my first team experience in sixth grade. Um, you would go in in sixth grade and by yourself just. Yes. And Jimmy Cox would come in. And sometimes he would say, like, hey, you know, good job. Try this. Give me something new. And sometimes he would just kind of see me there and ignore me. And all I wanted, I, I, maybe I'm wired differently than other people. All I wanted and all I have ever wanted as an athlete was my coach's approval and my coach's undying love and him to recognize my work. Um, and I think... Coach Cox did a great job of supporting me, but not, you know, like he like he ignored me. I went a little harder. That was my first team experience, and I was lucky that it was him. And I had him for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, all three years of middle school in North Carolina, um, at a school called Ravenscroft. I know in sixth grade I had the same feeling because I would go to basketball camps and I would write down every drill or I'd remember it. I just, and I would go home and I would practice it. And that's probably why we played in college because we just, at a young age, wanted to please whoever was coaching us, sure. right? And just play our best. Sure. So it's great that you had a coach. Do you think if you had a coach, any coach could have served that role? Or was this, was this, what did you find about this coach? Was he, was he a yeller? Was he intense? Like, what, or you would have pleased anybody. I would have pleased anybody. <laughs> in sixth grade, are you kidding? I just wanted to play. Um, I wanted to wear... My school jersey, you know, I wanted to wear, I, I'm a big fan of that, you know, like, you know, the name on the front of the jersey is extremely important to me. So I always took special pride, even even when, you know, my senior year, I went to IMG, I, I transferred to IMG for my senior year because I, I was getting recruited pretty well for soccer and I wanted to make sure that I was as adequately prepared for college as humanly possible. And I figured that a prep school, you know, living away from home and all that would help. And our high school team was we like IMG is different. That's like a training ground. So like you don't really play for your high school. You play for IMG. But I still played for my high school. And we actually our soccer jerseys were like 1970s bowling shirts. Like it was pretty comical. Um, but like it was always important to me to play for a team and play for my school. But yes, I was always wired that way. Whether it was school ball or AAU ball or, you know, travel soccer. Um, You know, I remember Coach Mike Dunleavy, who coached in the NBA for years and is awesome. So I remember him telling me when I was at Duke, you know, a story about he was coaching and, you know, he took his team to the garden because he was talking to them about Larry Bird's work ethic and how he always gets in the garden early. So, that, you know, whatever team he was coaching, I don't know if it was the Lakers or the Trailblazers or, you know, whatever team he was with at the time or the Bucks or something, he, he took them to the garden and, like, the lights were off. And he's like, 
come on, man. And these are pros. And so they sit there, and he's like, oh, it'll be out any minute. And so, you know, it's like 10, 15, 20 minutes. And the lights are out, no one's there. And so, you know, Coach Dunleavy's kind of going like, oh, crap, this, this is bad. Like, where the hell is this guy? And so the players are, like, riding him pretty hard. And then uh, he, like, catches something out of the corner of his eye. And he's like, that's what I thought. It was Larry Bird up in the concourse just running laps in the garden. And so he was shouted up, you know, hey. So he came down, and the guy was just – Sweat through, sweat through, shirt, socks, you know, like floppy socks, like all that. And so he's just like, hey, Larry, how long have you been here? He's like, oh, I don't know. I, like I lost track of how many laps I ran right around like 100, like pregame. So like I, I always had things like that that motivated me because I promise you if it's good enough for Larry Bird, it's good enough for Andy Borman. Right. I think I played at camp, basketball camp, but now it seems like everyone's starting earlier. So in second, third, fourth grade, what is the youngest team the Reds has? Second grade. So how does that work? And how do you identify? Are you looking for the best talent? I, I'm not. Honestly, yeah. I'm not involved. Okay. I, 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 don't, I don't get involved in team selection until about eighth grade. And even then, it's really coach's choice. You know, just like, um, you know, it, the only place in that I'm aware of where, you know, is the NBA. Like a GM picks a team and the coach coaches. Like other than that, like the college coach that coaches you is the same one recruiting you. You know, it's the same thing with high school whatnot. So I really let our coaches form and build their own teams. Um, so with our younger second, third, fourth graders – you know, our, our coaches form that team. They, they travel. The parents are heavily involved. Do they have to try out every year so if a second grader gets, he's going to get cut in third grade if he can't keep up? Or they, how does it work? Once again, coach's choice. <laughs> the thing I say to our coaches is I often think that the word loyalty is misused. You know, just because a player played on your second grade team, if you cut them from your third grade team, you're not being disloyal to the kid. You're, that's not your lot in life. If that was the case, then the most important tryout you could ever have was second grade. Because once you're in, you're in forever. You have to earn your way. Now, the thing that, in my opinion, from grade to grade... I think the benefit that you get is going into the next year's tryout. The coach knows exactly who you are, and he knows how hard you, And now look, that's the benefit, but that can also be the detriment. That can also be held against you. If, if you've been coached all of your fourth grade season and you show up to about 50% of the practices and you're a pain in the butt, and your parent is a headache, you better be phenomenal. Because, you know, our experience with you hasn't been great. Like, the, the, the benefit is that we know you and we know you intimately, as opposed to the kid that walks into a tryout that we don't know. That kid may be terrific, but if he has a bad day, he's getting judged on that one day. The benefit of playing for the Wrens, you know, is, is the fact that you're you're in the program and there's we know you, but there there's no guarantee you're not like just because you played on a seventh grade team, it doesn't mean you're going to play for our eighth grade team. Like you have to uphold your end of the bargain too, right? right? right. So what well, if if you were coaching a let's say fourth and fifth grade group or even a fourth or sixth grade, and then there's sort of the puberty like, mm-hmm. that that's a tough time for some kids, great time for others because they grow into a basketball body and then others do not. Mm-hmm. What do you look for? I think a kid can start basketball and doesn't have to start in second and third grade. They can start fourth and fifth. And I get better results with a kid who's never played because I can teach them the right way from the start. They have no bad habits. Mm-hmm. So what do you look for in fourth and sixth grade if you remember back to IMG or House of Sports when you were working or even Chicago when you were working with that age group? Like what, what would you say is it toughness, is it aggression? Because in my experience, aggression 
trumps everything else at that age. That just that the stronger kids can get to the ball mm -hmm. and coordination and attitude. What are, what are the the traits that you see make that make it stand out? Will, athletic ability, skill wise, the predominant thing I look at for anyone below seventh grade is can you handle the basketball? Can you, like, are you punting the ball all over the gym or can you actually handle the basketball? Because, you know, that that's generally the trait that makes everything else easier aside from shooting. Shooting is like archery. It is a taught skill. It is not a born, like you're not born with a great shot. You teach yourself how to shoot the ball. Steph Curry taught himself how to shoot, and his dad, Del Curry, had something to do with it too. Um, but if you're a good, if you, if you're if you have a good handle of the basketball, um, generally you're above average at finishing around the rim because you have good hands. Generally, your turnovers are not so high because you have good hands. You're not fumbling the ball. You know, a lot of missed layups and a lot of turnovers take place not because you just blew the layup. It's because on your way up, you're still trying to control the basketball. So I think that is the main thing I look for because everything else, if you have will, you know, if you have the will to be great and the will to compete and you're committed, if you can handle the basketball, I feel like I can teach you everything else. That's my opinion. Right, and how about in the seventh, seventh and eighth through ninth grade, like what's the next kids who make the next jump? Um, what do they have? Oh man, well, that's where you can really, you know, like start accurately predicting, you know, with, with a greater degree of certainty the older a kid gets, obviously, but, uh, you know, seventh grade, Probably like 50% on guessing whether a kid's going to be good or not. Eighth grade is probably, you know, 75%. Ninth grade, it's up, you know, in the high 80s, low 90s. You know, now what, what do you do? Like now you start to have an identity. So who are you? Less about position. You know, it's not necessarily position, p positional basketball. You know, like that, that's the thing I, I love when parents say to me, like, well, what position are you going to play my kid? Like, I don't know, like, if you want to try out, like, that's the thing I always say back, like, you want to try out for one position? Okay, so, like, if you want to be my point guard, like, you better, that's one position. But if you want to just be a guard, you can now try out for three positions. There's a much greater chance of you starting. But, like, you do start to have an identity. Guards, shooters, rebounders, athletes, post players. So in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, I, I try to have the kids all be guards. Like I don't try to pigeonhole Correct. the kid back to the basket whose mom and dad are six feet, even though he's big for his age. Correct. Make everyone handle, make everyone face as much as possible, be in it for the development and coordination of the kid. Mm -hmm. Seventh through ninth grade, you get a better look at genes, you look at the parents, you start to figure out, narrow down your positions at least. Mm -hmm. Right? Seventh through ninth grade, you kind of know what, what they're going to be. Not with 100% certainty. I mean, nothing's 100%. But you kind of say like, like, yes, train your kids growing up to be guards. That's why I said I judge them based on can they handle the basketball. The biggest travesty for a kid is the kid that's big early that stays the same size because they get played as a post player. My thing I say to parents about that, if you have a kid that's big early, don't complain about what position he plays on defense because that's really irrelevant. Whether he's in the middle of the zone or not, whether he's guarding a big play, like that's irrelevant. But on offense, you want him to be able to play with their face to the basket. It's not just like it's not your kid's fault that he's the biggest one. It's not your coach's fault that he can't find a bigger kid. You know, it kind of is what it is. And what are you doing on your side? You know, what are you doing on the side? What do you, you know, like... You know, I, like I said, positionless basketball growing up and then 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, you know who they are. Um, the older you get, you have to be able to do more. You know, it, it's kind of like you start, you know, like wide, how many things can you do well? And then the older you get, it kind of gets narrow because it's now like how many things can you do great? And you're, you know, when you're in high school, you're not going to be able to do very many things great, but you have to have an identity. Like, is your, you know, what's your fallback? What's your safety net? Is it defense? 
Is it court vision, you know, like being a team leader? Is it the ability to score? Is it the ability to shoot? Because shooting and scoring are two different things. Is it rebound? Like, so like you start wide, how many things can I do well? And then it narrows, how many things can I do great? And then you need to widen that. So like I can do one thing great, now I need to work my butt off and add a second thing. And be great at that. 100%, you need to add greatness. <laughs> One hundred percent. And at the end of the day, the more things you can do, great. But like, if you do everything average, you're probably a high school player. Right. Like, or or even if you do everything really well, you're probably a high school player, um, unless you're six eleven, because someone's going to take you. But like, if you do something great, like now you have a role. So with your college choice does what you do great match what your coach is looking for. But I think that's probably the progression of kids. And what about toughness? I know it's sort of hard to define, but I feel as though at this age, the most aggressive kids will go and get the ball, mm-hmm. go and get the ball, brick it up, you know, you go get the ball. That's the number one separator, I think, at the younger ages. But what ends up happening is skill starts to factor in more because the pool becomes more aggressive. Right, so what then happens at, at that high school level, what do you think is the differentiator at the, at the college level? Let's say top high school players, what's the next piece? I, I personally believe, this is another Coach Dunleavy thing. You know, I, I try to pick up, obviously, as many things from as many different people as possible. It, like, it's not my job to coach toughness. Like, that should be inherent in all the players. And it's not my job to coach effort. If I have to spend my time coaching effort and toughness, then what are you doing? Like, you need to bring something to the table. I'll bring my knowledge to the table and let me make, you know, because if I'm spending my time out to my half times and my practices begging you to play hard and pay attention, then we're not going to ever be able to make an adjustment. You know, like, what are we doing? The last time I was in your office, you said that the most profound quote, and you had plenty, was... Oh, jeez. And I, it, was, it was a good one. You, you were I was saying, like, how do you coach... Because at the younger level, at IMG and House of Sports, you have some kids who just don't care. Mm-hmm. And how frustrating that can be as a coach. And you, you basically said, I get in the huddle, and I say, if I care more about this than you do, then we have a problem. 100%. 100%. And the other thing, you know, because I'm not trying to get... What do I have to get out of this? I'm not trying to coach in college. I already, I already had that cup of tea. It wasn't for me. Why do I care more than you? The beauty of our situation is that I don't ever have to worry about that because if I care more than you, get out. It's a little different in the pay-to-play model you know, where their customers, they're paying for a service. The thing I say to them is, and it's different with each program, but when I ran the House of Sports, I would always have parent meetings, and I despised having them, but I had to have them anyways. But it was... You are paying for the training, not playing time. And then I would just say, like, you ain't playing. Oh, but well, I'm, I'm paying X amount of dollars. Yeah, I said that in the parent meeting. I'm sorry. You must not have cared enough to show up, just like your kid didn't care enough to come to practice. Not my fault. Like, and we're all busy here. And that's not me being rude. It's just like... Like, what are we teaching our kids here? You know, and I'm not saying that every kid has to be the best because I certainly wasn't. But I think for the most part, you're not going to, you know, playing time is earned no matter what. If you're playing on a real team, playing time is earned. Nothing is given. And then the second thing I always say that I love is um, don't worry about me yelling at you because me yelling at you, like, I care. I care enough to think that... You can do what I'm yes, saying. Yes, 100%. Right. Where you need to worry is when I don't yell at you. Because now that ship has sailed. Because you're not worth my time. And I think that that's not just a sport thing. I think when you call someone and they don't call you back, you are not very important to them. I don't care how busy someone is. There is always time to return a phone call. There's always time to shoot a text saying, I'm busy, I'll catch you later. And and that applies, you know, players, that applies to everything. That applies to your current coaches. That applies to college coaches. That applies to everything. If you call someone, now it doesn't mean they need to call you back in five minutes, but like, 
I promise you, if you're important to them, they're calling you back. Right. The minute. I just, you know, I just got a text message. I, I text him, you know, we'll call you back as soon as I get done with podcast. Guess what? That guy is very important to me. I'm not going to tell you who he is, okay. but he's very important. To, like, right. that's the way life works. Right. And at that next level, that toughness factor, the effort, if, if everyone is doing it, what are the next differentiators? Is it uh, shooting is shooting ability, like scoring ability? Is it mental? Is it uh, personal care? Is it it's, attitude? I, I think uh, all. No, I, I don't think there's one thing. I think the thing I'd say is, unless you're the best player, everyone's value is determined by their surroundings. If I'm a shooter, and there's a player on our team that's a shooter too, there's only one spot for a shooter. So if I'm his backup, what, do I, what am I going to do better than him? Because he's a better shooter than me, and that's my thing. So, like, what else? I better be able to beat him out in other areas. That's why I don't believe in pigeonholing your kid to a specific, you know, like, if I'm a defender, the best player will always play. And then there will be pieces around that player. You know, our 17U team this past year, we had two lights out. We had Raleigh Alkins, who's a top 20 kid in the country, and Mustafa Heron, who's a top 20 kid in the country. And then my job was to put three other players on the court that did everything. So I had to put a long-rangey defender that would always take the other team's best player. And I had to put a big rebounder and a finisher. You know, and then I had to put a glue guy out there that would do everything. And are, were there players coming off my bench that were certainly the, one of the top five talented kids? Absolutely, but the top... The five most talented kids don't always start. I was, it, I was the glue guy because you, you get a lot of minutes when you're the glue. One hundred percent. If you make everyone else happy, yep. you are the person. Figure everyone. And by the way, if you're that person, then you don't have to worry about going into the coach's office because the best players, like Raleigh and Mustafa, would come when we're on the road. They'd come knock on my hotel room door and say, "Like, hey, you got to play." The kid's name's Tyrone Cohen. He actually just committed to Holy Cross. Perfect commit. He, you got to play Tyrone more. So why? Why do you guys think he makes our life easier? He made like he'll do everything we like. He'll guard the best player. If I'm tired, he'll switch on to my man. He rebounds like he only takes good shots. Like he passes me the ball. You know, like I love this dude. I just love. I was yeah. on teams. If, if, I had, I think three players. I think you have. You had about three players. If you're not one of those three players, you gotta be value add, right? One hundred percent. I was I was one of the three players, and I had no problem if one of those other players outscored me, out rebound, and played better than me. I just wanted to win. Yeah. The, at the end of the day, like that was our power three. We had Mustafa Raleigh, and then we had a big kid, Tyreek Jones, who's going to Xavier. You know, six seven, two thirty five, and you know, at the end of the day, the only other than those three, the only stat that mattered for everyone else is the plus minus. When you were on the court, did our lead grow or shrink? Mm -hmm. nope. That's the only stat that matters. That's great. And all players should know that. In all different roles in their life, whether it's rec ball and they get in over their head or they're the star, like, they have to constantly assess, am I value add? And just because you're a stud, the, there will eventually be a time where you're the value add. Right. That's a no-brainer. Because even if... You're LeBron, and you're the best player since sixth grade. LeBron's got something coming to him. It's called time. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing Kobe's going through right now. You can't outrun time. Eventually, you're just going to get old. And there's going to be a kid that you're like, man, I was better than him when I was 23. You're not 23 anymore. That's, what, that's one of the great things that Michael Jordan did. His game evolved and changed with him and his athletic abilities and you know like who he was i think the the only thing i'd say to players is i can't tell you like are you a student of the game do you really watch basketball do you really like do you watch it as a fan because watching it as a fan is completely different than watching it as a as a student are you studying and then who are you studying like are you studying if you're a point guard you don't need to watch lebron you, you better be watching Chris Paul, 
better go back watch some Steve Nash tape. Like, and what type of point guard are you? Are you a super athletic long point guard? Okay, yeah, you can watch Rajon Rondo play. If you're like, if you're a suburban five ten to six two white kid, which by the way is the category I fit in. You better watch people that are just like you that were successful. So like the guy I watched a lot, like I watched Steve Wojciechowski when he was a point guard at Duke. Now Wojo's a hell of a lot better player than I ever was, but that's who I studied. You can't just go study as a six foot one former athlete, like how does studying Michael Jordan help me? Like that's great. I know a lot about his game, but that's because I studied him when I became a coach. So when you're a player, better study people in situations that are relevant to your personal situation. Right, and I try to ask kids when they watch a game to not just watch the ball. Like watch, be able to replay back to me why that play happened. That's exactly why you need to watch the people that are you. But you also have to see, right. Because like you're, you're not tracking the ball. Like if you want to be a basketball, then track <laughs> the basketball. True. But if you want to be a basketball player, then you need to track basketball players. So I will watch Wojo or Kenny Anderson or, you know, and when they give the ball up, I'm not watching Grant Hill now. Mm -hmm. I'm not Grant Hill. I'm going to watch what Wojo does off the ball. It's just my advice. I'm not always right, but I tend to bat above 500. That's great. So I I just want to wrap with the, the final three things that you didn't, looking back what you would have changed as a player and the three things that you did really well. Uh, and then I know the person who called is really important, but... No, no, it's okay, it's okay. No, that's why they, they know that I'm going to call Good. them when we finish. Good. So the three things that, looking back, I look back and I, I look, like nutrition was a big piece. I was eating, but I mm-hmm. wasn't eating right. And I was too hard on myself. And I, it, it's the little things I look back and wish I had adjusted. So if you can find three things that you could have adjusted or changed and then three things you just crushed. I wish, right, because they're, they're always the same. Like, generally, your biggest strength is your biggest weakness. My, one of my biggest weaknesses is I was, like, so emotionally invested that I was out of control. My emotional spectrum hinged. Um, I remember in high school, we lived, like, two miles away from the high school, Anytime we played at home, if it was a loss, I walked home because I could not be around anybody. Whatever poor girl I was dating at the time, very blatantly clear that like, if we lose, we're not talking. And my parents knew like, I would literally, if we lost, go into the locker room, I would sit there, coach was talking, I didn't hear anything they said, I would shower and I would just walk home. And if you, like, if you tried to talk to me, like, catching the wrath, uh, I, was, I was way too crazy. So that was one. I, I mean, I wish I would have got it earlier. I feel like I, I understood, but, like, you know, I probably wasted time. So that would be two. I don't know. I kind of, like, I kind of hit my ceiling. I don't know if I could have gone further than I did. I outkicked my coverage. Well, that's what I think makes you a happy person is because you know you gave yeah, everything Yeah, I, went, I went to the limit. I couldn't have done more. You know, like if, if I, I played out my hand, I bluffed as far as I could possibly bluff. I don't know. I, I think the third thing I would say is like I'm, I'm sure that I, I could have absolutely been more focused, you know, whether that is just doing things better, I guess. I, I mean, everyone can always do things better. So, and then as far as like what I think I just crushed and did really well, I think I cared, you know, it's just like I said, it was my biggest weakness is my, you know, like I think I was a, a terrific teammate. Whoever I played with know that knew that I would do whatever I could possibly do, not just for myself, but for them and for the team. And, and at the end of the day, you still have friends 15 years after you hang it up. I think, I think the biggest thing I had is that I was, I craved feedback in any form. It's kind of like the kid, like, I don't care. I just need attention. You know, whether, whether it's positive or negative, I don't care if you love me or you're grounding me. I want, like, I was that way about sports. Whenever I came off of the high of winning, you know, every time we won, I thought we won the national championship. And every time we lost, I, I, I thought that Armageddon was coming. But whenever I got off that roller coaster, 
then it, I, it couldn't be enough feedback about what I did. I really didn't even care what I did well. It was more like, what could I have done better? But what in, in this scenario, I did this, what do you, I don't know. I think I was a coach when I was a player. So that's, that's my story. Okay. It's an awesome story. You've been terrific and really helpful for me as a person who's trying to be a better leader and a better coach. And I hope the parents and the kids have, have learned a lot from it. Thank you very much. No problem. I'm Maureen Hullihan, and I want to thank you for listening to the Mo Motion podcast. At Mo Motion, we offer blogs, podcasts, and advice on the best in youth basketball training, performance, and excellence. To get our latest and greatest, go to momotion.org and join the huddle.